Hello everybody and welcome to a new video on the Mirror Lessons channel. I'm your host Matt and in this episode we're going to talk about the new Olympus 150-400mm f4.5 Pro lens with built-in teleconverter. This video is going to be divided in three parts. In part one I'm going to show you everything you need to know about the build quality and the optical quality. Then I'm going to show you the performance when paired with the M1X and the latest firmware update that enables bird detection autofocus. In the last part I'm going to show you how it compares to a full frame setup with the Canon 800mm 5.6 and I will explain exactly why I chose that lens and I will share some extra feedback about the two systems. Before getting started I would like to thank Olympus UK and Olympus Europe for sending the lens so early. I know that at the time of publishing this video there are very few samples in Europe so obviously I was grateful to be among the first to be able to test this lens. And I also want to thank Harry Camera for sending a copy of the 800mm 5.6, the Canon lens. And for the record, this is not a sponsored message, I haven't been paid by Olympus or Harry Camera to produce this video. Alright, now let's get started and let's have a look at what we have here. So this is the 150-400mm lens, we have the OMD M1X, and we also have the 2x and 1.4x teleconverter. Let's begin with the lens cap, which is a bit different than the usual lens, although it is common for this type of super telephoto lens. And you just remove it like this. The lens hood is made of carbon fiber, it is very lightweight. And the lens itself is very lightweight. Uh, Olympus managed to keep everything under two kilograms. I was very surprised when I first took it out of the box because it looks smaller and lighter than what uh, the official photograph suggests. Olympus used a mix of magnesium alloy and carbon fiber with enforced polycarbonate to keep everything under two kilograms. And the build quality is really, really good. The zoom ring and the focus ring are covered in rubber. The zoom ring is very smooth to turn, but yet very precise to control. And the focus ring is of course a fly-by-wire focus ring, but it is also very smooth and very nice to turn. On the side we have five switches. The first one is for the focus limiter. And if you leave it at the center, you can override this with the AF limiter setting on the camera that you can customize. Then we have autofocus, minor focus switch, and stabilization on and off, which is pretty standard. Then we have the function and preset switch. So if you set it to function, any of these function button lenses here, uh, there's four around the lens in total, any of these function button will respond to uh, any function that you assign via the camera menu. So the default setting is uh, to stop the autofocus, but if you want, you can actually engage the autofocus or assign another function. If you switch it to preset, then these buttons will recall a precise focus distance that you saved with the set button that is here. Then we have the beep on and off, and this is actually uh, to activate or deactivate a confirmation sound when you save that precise focus distance with the set button I showed you before. The lens has a large tripod color that can be rotating in uh, 360 degrees, and the tripod foot is compatible with Arca Swiss tripod. So if you have an Arca Swiss tripod with an Arca Swiss head, you can mount the lens directly on the tripod without the need of a tripod plate. You can remove the foot if you don't want it, but you need to unscrew these four hexagonal screws here so it can't be removed quickly. And finally, we have this lever that activate or deactivate the built-in teleconverter. And there's also a lock switch. And the position of this lever is very nice because when you hold the camera, your right hand naturally is naturally close to uh, the lever, so it becomes easy to activate or deactivate it while holding the camera. The 150 to 400 mm gives you lots of possibilities when it comes to field of view and maximum reach. Not only thanks to the built-in teleconverter, but also thanks to the compatibility with the optional MC14 and MC20. Here you can see how narrow the field of view can get with a maximum of 1000mm equivalent with the lens alone and the built-in teleconverter or 2000mm equivalent when using the built-in teleconverter and the optional MC20. And here is a real world example of how close you can get. When using the converters, the fastest aperture changes. With the lens alone is 4.5, if you activate the built-in teleconverter it becomes 5.6 and then with a combination of the optional teleconverters and the built-in teleconverters you can get all the way from 6.3 to f11.
I've done my usual test to assess the quality of this lens, but I'm only going to show you the most important examples so that the video doesn't become too long. And I'm also gonna try to show you as many real world examples as possible. Concerning sharpness, the performance is really good. It's sharp across the frame and throughout the zoom range. The quality is excellent right from f4.5 and the lens peaks at the fastest aperture already for most of the zoom range. Only at 400mm, 5.6 is a bit sharper than 4.5, but it is a small difference. With the built-in teleconverter, the result is a bit softer at the fastest aperture of 5.6 and peaks at a fade. But here as well, we're talking about a very small difference. What impressed me the most about this lens is the close focus capabilities. Not only 1.3 meter is really short for a zoom of this kind, but the minimum distance remains more or less identical, all the way up to 400 mm with the built-in teleconverter and with the optional MC14 and MC20, and sharpness remains at the top level. And just for reference, this is the diameter of the eye of the stuffed toy. Basically, this lens allows you to catch the eagle flying into the distance as well as insects next to you. Speaking of the optional teleconverters, sharpness remains very good when attached. Only when combining the MC20 and the built-in teleconverter, the image gets a bit softer. With a long focusing distance, sharpness can decrease more significantly, especially if affected by atmospheric distortion, also known as heat wave or thermal distortion, which can happen in the winter as well. This is a known issue when using super telephoto lenses of any kind. The bokeh rendering is good, although like many lenses of this kind, lots of elements close to one another, such as naked branches on a tree, can make the autofocus area a bit distracting. I haven't found any trace of chromatic aberration nor distortion, and vignetting is almost non-existent at 4.5. The autofocus motor of the 150 to 400 mm lens is very fast and very silent. Now with super telephoto lenses, sometimes you have this odd misfocus behavior where the lens focuses even too far or too short. And so the entire image becomes out of focus. And because there's so much blur, the camera can struggle to detect any contrast or any subject and refocus correctly. And in that case, the best thing to do is to just stop focusing and then re-engage focus and hope that the camera will find the subject again. And to be fair, with the Olympus lens, it only happened a few times, and when re-engaging focus, the lens was very quick to acquire focus correctly. And this is also something you can avoid by using the focus limiter, either with the switch on the lens or the AF limiter setting in the camera. Along with the lens, Olympus sent me a sample of the M1X so that I could test firmware 2.0 and the updated intelligent subject detection mode that now works with birds. To activate it, you go in the custom menu A3 page and select birds as the tracking subject. The M1X can detect a bird very quickly and it can do it even if the subject is far away, meaning when it is small in the frame. In fact, there isn't a single time where it didn't recognize a bird during my test. The shot that surprised me the most is this one with the magpie on the horse's back. The camera initially focused on the horse, but then switched to the bird almost immediately. The other interesting thing is that once it recognizes the bird, it moves the tracking area to the head very quickly, that is if the bird is large enough in the frame. Sometimes it can detect more birds than there are in the frame, getting confused by a piece of log out of the water or an autofocus leaf pending from a branch. But as long as there is a bird in the picture, it always gets priority. With static subjects or subjects that move slowly, Bird detection works well, but it is not perfect, and sometimes the subject can be slightly out of focus. It is important to keep the continuous AF sensitivity to zero or even lower so that the tracking is not too erratic and tries to refocus too quickly. If you're photographing a small perch bird on a tree, the branches and other elements around it can confuse the system easily. The camera will often focus on the nearest branch, like in this example. If there are multiple birds in your photo, the M1X will choose one over the other depending on the AF area selected. If you use all the 121 points, it will focus on the bird that is the closest to the center of the frame. With a smaller area like 1 target, 5 target or 9 target, it will focus on the bird that is the closest to the target area. 
So if you have two animals in the frame, like in this example, you can move such area to the left or right, and the camera will prioritize the left or right subject. There isn't a way to automatically switch from one detected subject to the other, you have to manually move the AF area. Perhaps this is something that Olympus can improve via firmware update. Then we have my usual birds in flight test, and if you've been following my work, you're already familiar with it. With the M1X, I used the same settings that gave me the best result over the years on other OMD cameras as well. I'm not going to describe all of them because I have a dedicated tutorial about birds in flight with OMD cameras. I'll leave the link in the cards or in the description below. Obviously here, the main difference is that I use CF plus tracking instead of the CF alone. And before seeing the results, let's have a look at some sample images. The autofocus performance is more or less the same at every focal length. So if you're shooting at 300 mm or 400 mm or even 400 mm with the built-in teleconverter, the autofocus performance is consistent, which is a very good thing. Bird detection works well, but it can sometimes be a bit slow to lock onto the bird. Sometimes it can confuse the bird with the background and misfocus on the background. And sometimes it struggles to keep track of the bird on the entire sequence. And you can see that in the live view because the green rectangle becomes orange. Here is the best score I got with bird detection autofocus on the M1X. The green score is for 100% sharp images only. The blue score also includes slightly soft results, like 90% or 95% sharp. Then we have the best score I got with the M1X and any other OMD camera using the normal continuous AF mode and the 5x5 area mode, which remain, in my experience, the best settings for birds in flight. The 150 to 400 mm lens has an official rating of 4.5 stops of compensation, and that is for the optical stabilization alone. If you pair it with the M1X and the 5-axis sensor stabilization of the camera and Sync IS, which means it uses sensor and optical stabilization at the same time, you get 8 stops of compensation. I did my usual tests for the sake of it indoor, and at 150 mm I got a sharp shot at one fourth of a second, at 400 mm, you need to uh, choose one eighth of a second. With the built-in teleconverter, it's better to stay around one thirty of a second. Of course, when taking pictures of animals, you need a faster shutter speed than that, unless the animal is perfectly still, which is not always a given. So the important news here is that at one hundred of a second or two hundred of a second, this lens can deliver sharp result all the time, even at 400 mm, and even with the built-in teleconverter. The stabilization also works well with the optional teleconverters, and if you put the MC20 and go all the way to 2000 meter equivalent, you can still use this lens handheld. Now, of course, with such a narrow angle of view, it becomes a challenge to keep the uh, animal at the center of the frame. You know, every small movement of your body is going to change drastically your composition. So it's not easy, but in terms of the technical possibility, yes, this lens can be used all the way up to the longest range. Then we have the performance for movie recording. Five years ago, I did a short video of grey seals in a location in North Wales called Angle Bay, and I was using the original M1, and I was testing the, at the time, brand new 300mm f4 Pro lens. And that lens was the first Olympus Micro Foods lens with optical stabilization and Sync IS compatibility. The result I got from that uh, video recorded and held was very impressive. The level of stabilization was just something never seen before. And to this day, it remains one of the best stabilization tests I ever done. So I was curious five years later to see if the M1X and this new 150-400 lens could give me an even better result.
I use the MIS-1 setting, which adds digital stabilization and a 1.19 times crop that helps making the footage more stable. Plus, the extra crop can be useful for wildlife. Then I set the IS level to plus one, which makes static shots more stable. For panning shots, it is better to put it at minus one. It will be less stable, but also smoother with the movement. Obviously, it's not always perfect, and you can see some very small erratic movements in the background sometimes, and also if you move a bit with the camera, you can sometimes get these abrupt shifts in composition, and you have to be ever so careful with every movement of your body, even breathing can uh, create problems. But when you get it right, we're really not far from a perfect result. So why this comparison? Well, since the release of the 300mm f4 Pro, Olympus started to build a professional and lightweight alternative to the DSLRs that have dominated the wildlife genres until now. Then came the M1X, which is at the time of publishing this video the only mirrorless camera with a built-in battery grip, and now this 150-400mm lens. So if you follow the evolution, it makes sense. They went from smaller and more affordable products to more professional products that make the system more complete. So if we consider this lens the best, the very best Olympus has to offer for high-end wildlife photography, how does it compare to the best or one of the best lenses a full-frame system has to offer? I could have built this comparison in different ways by choosing different lenses. For example, Canon has a 200-400mm f4 with built-in teleconverter and Nikon has a 180-400mm with the same characteristics. However, the field of view would have been significantly different on a full-frame camera. The 800mm represents the longest reach currently available in Canon's catalog, but also this 800mm matches 400mm on the M1X when it comes to field of view. I thought it was interesting to choose field of view as the leading topic for this comparison, how close each system allows you to get to a subject with the pros and cons. For the camera, I use the EOS R6 for convenience because I own one, but also because it has animal detection autofocus and it works with birds too, therefore giving me the opportunity to make the comparison more complete. It also has the same resolution as the M1X, which is 20 megapixel. Right, so let's take a look at the Canon lens. And obviously, it is much bigger and I hope I can actually fit it under here. Yes, there we go. So, first of all, the Canon 800m 5.6 was announced in 2008, so it's a 12 years old lens at the time of making this test, which is important to mention, but it still is on sale and actually the price has gone up. It features optical stabilization, four stops of compensation. It has, ooh, heavy. It has similar switches to the Olympus lens, so we have the focus limiter here, autofocus, manual focus, stabilization on and off, and you also have the preset switch for the set button, which does the same as the Olympus lens, so to save a precise focus distance. And you also have this uh, stabilization mode switch. Position one means that it uh, corrects shakes in all direction. Position two means it corrects vertically if you're panning horizontally, or corrects horizontally if you're panning vertically. Note that on the Olympus, you can control this directly in the camera. There is no built-in teleconverter on this lens, but I tried it with the uh, two times EF teleconverter from Canon, this is the Mark III version. And uh, another interesting thing, there is a drop-in filter holder, as you can see, and you can put uh, gelatin filters on it. This is something you won't find on the Olympus lens because the Olympus lens has a 95 millimeter uh, filter thread on the front of the lens. Concerning the optical performance, sharpness is good at 5.6, but the lens peaks at f8. Compared to the Olympus lens, the Canon is less sharp when both are set to their respective fastest aperture. When stopped down, the difference is reduced. Since I was talking about the main topic being the maximum field of view you can get, the 2x converter gives you an equivalent 1600mm focal length, and that is the maximum you can get. With the extender, sharpness decreases on the Canon lens more than what the MC20 does on the 150-400mm. We have two different sensor sizes, as you can see from these images, and that brings differences in image quality. With birds, there are two typical situations where the sensor can help. 
The first is when the light is not ideal. You are forced to raise the ISO because the subject is in the shade or because you need to use a fast shutter speed to freeze the movement. No surprises here. The Olympus has more noise and details are more washed out as a result. This is especially relevant from ISO 6400. If I take into account the fastest aperture of the two lenses I tested, then the M1X has two thirds stop advantage because I can open at 4.5 versus 5.6 on the Canon. This improves the quality a little, but the R6 files remain very clean. The R6 has a wider ISO range that goes all the way up to 204,800 ISO. The highest levels produce too much noise, but in difficult situations, something like 25,600 ISO will give you decent results. That is the value where the EM1X ISO range stops and the difference in quality is more relevant. I could also compare 4.5 versus f8 since f8 is where the Canon lens peaks in terms of sharpness, but you know, the test just wants to give you an idea of how did your system compare. Plus, as I said at the beginning, the Canon lens is much older. I imagine that if Canon would decide to redesign a lens like this today, perhaps for the RF mount, they will certainly improve many things, including sharpness. The second situation where the sensor can make a difference is dynamic range. With birds in flight, you can occasionally get a few shots with incorrect exposure, for various reasons. Photographer's mistake or the camera meter incorrectly because the contrast between the bird and the background is difficult to read. And even without an incorrect exposure, you may want to open the shadows to show more details on the subject or recover some highlights if it has white plumage. The first example is a shot I purposely underexposed to see how much information I can recover in the shadows. Up to two stops of recovery, the EM1X defends itself well. It produces a bit more noise in the darker areas, but the difference becomes more apparent when you deal with a three stop recovery. Then I overexposed the same scene to see how much detail I could recover in the highlights. Here I got an unexpected result. With a two stops overexposed image, both cameras managed to recover roughly 100% of the details in the bright zones. With three stops of overexposure, the OMD camera beats the Canon model. Neither can recover all the details, but the Olympus preserves more data and more colors as well. Then, out of curiosity, I throw in the mix my Sony A7 Mark III and this time the result was more what I was expecting, with the Sony recovering more details than the other two cameras. This is an interesting result because it shows it's not always black and white when it comes to sensor size and image quality, and that two cameras with the same sensor format can have different results. The Canon 800mm behaved very well when it comes to autofocus with the EOS R6 and the EF2 RF adapter. Uh, however, if the focus distance was too uh, short or too long in comparison to the subject's position, then the camera and the lens struggled to focus at all. I had to pre-focus manually and then the camera was able to complete the job and focus uh, successfully on the subject. I guess this is probably because it's an old lens and perhaps the communication with the adapter and the camera is not 100% perfect. Apart from this issue though, the camera and the lens did really well, especially with my birds in flight test. The Canon setup gave me a much better keeper rate than the OMD combo. Unlike the M1X, animal detection on the R6 gives me the best results. Furthermore, the score you see is the same I got with the Canon RF 100-500mm lens. So whether you use the most recent lens for the RF mount or an old EF lens with adapter, the R6 delivers the same performance. The 800mm lens has a decent optical stabilization. If you combine it with the R6, uh, so the R6 has five axis stabilization, uh, but when using an EF lens in the adapter, it only uses three axes on the sensor, and those are X, Y, and wall, and then the two axes on the lens, which are pitch and yaw. Shutter speed of one two hundred of a second is not a given, so you really need to use one four hundred of a second or even faster 
to be sure to have a sharp shot every time. Obviously, given the size and weight of the lens, you don't want to uh, use it handheld for too long. It is possible, but you know, you're gonna get tired after five or 10 minutes. Certainly, this is the biggest difference between these two systems, not just because of the stabilization performance, but the whole portability concept. And I don't think I'm saying anything new here. It was obvious from the start. There are other things I could talk about, you know, aspect ratio, uh, depth of field equivalence, and of course there are more than one brand in the full frame market. Uh, you also have Nikon and Sony, but then this video will become too long. One aspect I want to mention though is sensor resolution. You know, with wildlife photography, even if you have the longest lens available and the best teleconverter, you may still not be close enough to your subject. So if you have more resolution, uh, you can crop in post-production and retain good image quality. And also more resolution gives you more options when it comes to lenses. In this test, I used the EOS R6 because I own one, but I could have gone with the EOS R5, which has 45 megapixel. And that, for example, would have allowed me to use the APS-C mode or crop in post to go beyond 2000 mm equivalent if paired with the two times teleconverter, or use a 600 mm lens and get a similar reach to the Olympus gear. And of course, it also depends on the maximum reach you need. The bottom line is that there are multiple combinations available and more resolution can help with that. The EM1X has a high resolution mode that works handheld and gives you an 80 megapixel file. The good news is that it works even at 400 mm, as you can see, which is quite impressive. However, your subject needs to be still, which is not always easy with wildlife. Even if it just moves a little bit, there will be less details and some artifacts. I couldn't make this work for the birds I photographed personally during my time with the lens, but I know this is possible and other photographers have succeeded. You can see the excellent work of Thomas Sturr, for example. I'll leave the link in the description. Right, we reached the end of this video, so I'm going to share my final thoughts about the Olympus lens. And of course, I have to start with the price because this is an expensive lens. It is the most expensive micro product Olympus has ever released. And I think many micro users are not accustomed with such a high price. I know that many of you were hoping for something more affordable. So the question then is, has Olympus gone too far with this lens and this price tag, or is it worth it? Well, if I have to summarize my experience, I have to say that it is an impressive lens. You know, the build quality is something that has never been seen before in a micro lens. It is probably one of the most complex optical design that Olympus has ever made. The optical quality is really, really, really good. And then you have all the versatility with the field of view, the angle of view, the minimum focus distance, the long focus distance. And also, despite being the largest lens currently available for micro thirds, it still remains portable, it is still tripod free, and you're still not tired at the end of the day. So if all this can make a difference for you or for any photographers that go out in the wild, in the nature every single day, then perhaps the lens is yes, expensive, but also worth it. From a DSLR point of view, if we look at the super telephoto lenses available in the Nikon system, Canon system or Sony system, the Olympus lens actually becomes the most affordable option. For example, the Canon 800mm lens I compared it to cost $13,000. You may think that Micro Four Thirds and its small sensor don't deserve a lens like this, but I think my video showed that despite the usual differences in image quality that we're all aware of, the Olympus system doesn't compare too bad and has its place when it comes to wildlife photography. And if you're willing to sacrifice a bit of quality for portability, then the benefits can be there and can be many. Finally, I have to say that this lens arrives at a critical time, not just because of the global pandemic uh, we're all facing, but also because of what's happening inside Olympus itself. Um, the imaging division business has just been sold. And I know that many of you are uncertain, or have doubts about the future of the system. I've also received uh, different emails from readers and viewers asking me, you know, if whether or not it is worth to continue investing in Olympus and Marco Four Thirds or not. And the truth is, I don't know because I don't have inside information on what is happening. All I can do is to wish for the system to survive because I think it has brought many interesting things until now, and I believe it can continue to do so, and hopefully. Uh, we can get new cameras, new sensor, improved performance, improved autofocus. I think 
the OMD system deserves to have a place in the camera market, just like this lens, I think, has a place in the camera market as well. That's it. Thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. As usual, if you have any questions, don't hesitate to leave a comment. Please like the video and subscribe, and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.